we're gonna let the Zoom people in right now. Okay. And uh, we're just expecting this room to be filled. So since parking's kind of hard, we're gonna just give it a few extra minutes. If you're here for extra credit, you need permission from your professor to get it. You can't just give it to them and say, give me some extra credit. <laughs> okay, so make sure you speak to your professor first. We have parking passes. Everybody should have a parking pass on their car. Lunch is at 12 o'clock and it's gonna be really good. And it's vegetables and chicken, so it should be really good. And uh, on the table are little brains. You see the little colored brains? Those are gifts for you today. Uh, they're little squeezy toys. And uh, inside the backpack, I think there's some little gifts inside there too. I just wanted to um, thank you very much for coming. Daniela and I have <laughs> been working on this for several months. And uh, the initial concern was that students get psychotic and it's very difficult for us to lead them to care. So I was talking to Danielle and I said, boy, I wish there was a class that I could take. So Daniela hooked us up and figured everything out. So thank you very much for coming. Um, the first person that is going to be speaking is Dr. Helene Mirzakanian. And she is the clinical director of the Care Early Psychosis Specialty Clinic and associate clinical professor in the UC San Diego Department of Psychiatry. She performs comprehensive psychiatric evaluation, provides therapy, and educates patients and their families on the different aspects of psychotic illness. Her expertise is in treating individuals with early symptoms of psychosis, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder with psychotic features. So she's our major expert. And then we have Dr. Donna Corbet is a licensed psychologist. She specializes in early psychosis treatment and intervention with a special interest in how the duration of untreated psychosis impacts long-term prognosis. She currently facilitates the wellness group and DBT groups at the CARE program. She served as the faculty advisor to the Active Minds Club, a student-run organization aimed at reducing the stigma of mental illness on college campuses. We have one at Mesa too, if anyone wants to join. Wendy Zhang is a PhD student in the SDSU UC San Diego Joint Doctoral Program in Clinical Psychology. Wendy's research focuses on understanding the disturbances in cognitive and emotional processes underlying psychosis in both adults living chronically with schizophrenia and youth experiencing early psychosis. Clinically, Wendy is interested in working with individuals experiencing psychosis across the lifespan and providing recovery-oriented care. Then we have Daniela Cardenas, MHP. She's the recruitment study coordinator of the care program. And Noor Alamar is a research study associate from, from the care program. So let's get started. Do you guys want to start off? Um, oh, by the way, it, this is being recorded, just to reinforce that. And then um, it'll be posted on our webpage. So thank you very much for coming, and hope you enjoy the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to just uh, introduce ourselves again one more time briefly and then also go over the agenda and uh, one thing I wanted to know is how many of you here are students okay and how many are mental health providers or clinicians okay. and uh, the rest are student health counselors, counselors and yeah counselors Okay, okay, thank you. I just wanted to know, you know, a little bit um, 
Zoom because I know that we have also a, a lot of people on Zoom. So, uh, hello, Zoom people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So today's agenda, we will um, actually Dr. Corbett will start, and she will start with talking a little bit about what is psychosis. Give us an overview of the syndrome itself. We will talk then about the very early signs of psychosis because that's one of the important things that we want to uh, impart on you today is that the earlier we are able to identify these, uh, these signs of psychosis or unusual thinking or disordered thinking, the earlier we can intervene. And the earlier we intervene and help, the better the outcome. So that is one of the key points that we can, you know, I want you to take home today. Um, and so we will talk about the early signs. Uh, we will present the case vignette. And we will also talk about some of the assessment tools that we use but also some assessment tools that you can use, some screening measures, if um, these are kind of self-report, so you can do them for yourself, or you can administer them to um, other students and other members um, if you uh, suspect um, some challenges. Uh, and then we will break uh, very briefly, and then I will talk a little bit about how to engage students into care. Uh, just in general, engaging um, anyone into mental health care is not easy. Um, and, you know, we will, even ourselves, if we want, oh, sure. um, even ourselves, you know, thinking about going to a therapist, it takes us probably a while to make that decision. So, um, there are ways that we can facilitate that a little bit. And then we will have Wendy Chang, who will talk a little bit about stigma and uh, how that relates to engaging and facilitating care or how we can address stigma to uh, help uh, individuals uh, go and seek care. Uh, we will then break for lunch and then we will have a guest speaker, Christine Frey, who um, she will introduce herself at the time, but she is a, a peer advocate. So she will come and talk about her own experience uh, living and overcoming and recovering uh, you know, from uh, mental health issues. And then um, lastly, we will talk a little bit about treatment and care. Uh, we will talk about what the gold standard is when someone has psychotic-like symptoms or psychosis and um, what uh, research suggests is the best way to treat. Then, and then we will also talk a little bit about re local resources and specifically about the care program. So, um, please, Thank you. Dr. Corbett. Thank you. Is that a little louder? Is that okay? It's okay? Good. I'm into the thumbs up lately. Mm -hmm. Always doing that on Zoom now. My kids too. Thumbs up everything. Actually, sometimes I get this, but you know, that's about it. So I am a psychologist with the CARE program um, since about 2015. And what I'm going to talk about today is the early signs of psychosis, some things that um, we kind of we want to pay attention to early warning signs. Um, you know, I noticed there's a lot of different disciplines here. I noticed with campus police. Um, you probably encounter some of this. I know when I was in the community colleges that we would get a lot of these like crisis calls for students who are having psychosis, um, and sometimes it's con there's a lot of confusion about what's going on. So we're here to clarify that and to explain. Okay, so this is our team. Um, we have both, without going into too much detail, we have both a research um, program as well as a clinical program. Okay, so what we do at UCSD CARE is, again, we have the research as well as the clinical, and we employ evidence-based treatments for individuals that are clinical high risk, and also those who are having a first episode of psychosis. Okay, that's really wordy, so let me explain what that means. 
If you've ever heard of the term prodrome, is like or prodromal is what it used to be called, which is essentially the period before an acute psychosis. There, we are trained in identifying the warning signs of the prodrome so that we can hopefully intervene as early as possible before it gets to like a full psychotic episode. And I'll show you a chart of the trajectory of that as we go forward. Um, so we've got a great team of clinicians, scientists, and trainees. We have um, students, we have psychiatry residents who rotate through us. We have psychologists, psychiatrists. So it's a, it's a great program if I may say so myself. Um, okay. Some of the early warning signs that we want to pay attention to are these changes in thoughts, behaviors, or emotions. Now, that could be subtle. We're gonna go through some case examples, maybe what some of those symptoms actually look like. The main diagnoses that we treat at our clinic and in our research is those at risk for psychosis, um, those with a psychotic disorder, which is schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, and also mood disorders. So that's like bipolar one or bipolar two with psychosis. And then we have um, some that have more brief psychotic episodes that only last like one month. We always want to take our time in evaluating. Um, we want to be really careful with adding you know, these diagnoses, they do take some time to kind of look at, maybe to present themselves. So we try to monitor very closely before we address or put any label. Um, and we always look at whether there's like substances involved, a general medical condition involved. There's a lot of different things that can cause psychosis that isn't necessarily schizophrenia. So in our research studies, we offer biomarker studies um, where participants can get a brain MRI, EEG, genetics, um, and stress hormones. We also offer, which is I think really nice within this the research realm, is we offer these psychosocial studies where participants without any insurance or no cost to them they can get these treatments. And these are evidence-based treatments which maybe we're still doing research on in our specific, we have a very specific population. So for example, the family therapy, we offer to um, participants who are in that high risk category. And that will include themselves as well as uh, one family member. And that's free of charge, and that's a six month long treatment that they get. Um, we also have a diet study where we're coming up with some dietary recommendations for our population, um, as well as a CBD study where participants can get CBD at no charge to them, of course. It's, there's no THC involved with any of that. Um, to see if that helps with some psychotic symptoms. Okay. Let's talk about early warning signs. I usually preface this by saying that even before I started at CARE, I was at prison. I wasn't in prison, I was <laughs> in prison. And uh, so I, I saw a fair amount of psychosis. And I was also in the community college district. I was at my internship and my postdoc was um, Fresno City College, Reedley College, and that district up there in like Fresno Clovis area. And even then, and I would be on crisis duty, I did not fully understand these symptoms. I would have loved for somebody to come give me a talk on this because now, many of the cases that I saw or some of the bizarre behavior that I saw, I'm like, oh, okay, I understand now. 
I get it. These are early warning signs. Um, very subtle, but usually have a bit of a bizarre twinge to them, which we'll all explain. Okay. I am talking about these. So I've been using these buzzwords, and please, if anything isn't clear, I know we get used to speaking in certain lingo. If something's not clear, like please ask a question, raise your hand, jump in. Um, prodrome is the period before psychosis happens. Um, research has found that of the individuals in the prodromal phase, or what we, we now call it clinical high risk, or CHR, that about 30% of them go on to have full psychosis. So it's actually like pretty good, uh, as far as most of them do not. And what we know is the earlier we intervene, the better. Um, a lot of our research looks at identifying risk factors for that group and what could um, contribute to um, psychosis. And one of the very like, well-known studies at our lab was we found that THC use significantly um, impacted, had a significant um, impact on the conversion to psychosis among this group of folks. So, you know, we see these people in our clinic too, and I tread lightly, but I do give them the data. Because we, we have young folks. Our population is from about 12 to 35. And, you know, sometimes it's a harm reduction model, meaning they, there's sometimes there's substances involved, and we, we want to give them the information so they can make an informed decision. And, of course, our recommendation is don't use anything. But that's not always realistic in every case. So the prodromal phase, let me see if I have, okay, perfect. Um, so the prodromal phase, you'll see here um, from child to adolescence, some of these symptoms will go from no symptoms to some nonspecific symptoms, meaning very vague, uh, very vague declines in functioning, maybe some odd behavior, um, some social challenges at school. Um, and then the prodromal phase typically occurs in adolescence to young adulthood. Um, and that could last one to three years. And that's, the, that's really where, that's the high risk group. That's where we want to target. Um, and of those, 30% will go on to have psychosis. But again, all is not lost if you've had psychosis, there's a lot we can do to treat, to intervene, to recover, and so you'll notice the slope goes down um, in, you know, symptoms, it's not, they, they can, they'll reach a peak oftentimes, and that could be the police being called, that could be a referral to um, student services, that could be a counseling referral, where symptoms have reached a peak, but we can intervene with therapy, medications, um, group therapy. There's a lot of interventions that can help bring stabilize and also keep the symptoms at a, at a low level, if not in remission. Our goal for those who have had psychosis is for their symptoms to remit. Any questions so far? Yeah, are, are you saying that three to five years in childhood, there's something a little bit different? Yeah, we often hear about trouble making friends, um, super non-specific symptoms, uh, maybe not quite fitting in. Um, some of these children, some of our patients who come to us now in young adulthood or in later adolescence will say, hey, I kind of was seeing some stuff like in the corner of my eye, and I wasn't quite sure what was there, and I would look. Or I had ideas that I wasn't really real. A lot of these things that kids will keep to themselves, and then when it progresses later on and we provide the education, they go, hey, I was experiencing that when I was in elementary even. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Now, after the pandemic, the three to five year old kids are all exhibiting bizarre symptoms. <laughs> yeah. Especially social skills. Yes. 
hard, having a hard time in the schools. Mm -hmm. Is there anything integrated into this existing system to address those issues of this upcoming problems in this generation? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a moving target that we have been addressing too with the care clinic as well. Um, I, it's definitely a time of increased stress. Um, social interactions are different. So we do have a number of group therapies at CARE, and one of them is our team group, where we meet via Zoom, uh, but the teens, they provide support to one another, and they can kind of share about what their experiences are. Um, in addition to that, we have a family support group where we meet with parents and then separately with the students. We talk, a, we work a lot with the counselors at the schools, uh, just for each student's particular needs, we try to tailor the intervention, try to provide as much support as possible. But yeah, it's been a challenging time. Um, and we've noticed that some of our, we've noticed that some of our patients have weathered it better than others. And definitely this like reintegration back into going to classes, have, we've just noticed a spark, like a spike in um, you know, stress and having, having difficulty socially. So yeah, we've definitely seen that and it's definitely something we're working on addressing, ongoing. The reason I ask is uh, there's a special uh, group of kids now cannot be evaluated in under any other IEP evaluations to get these services, but they do have problems. Yes, yes. So when you say they can't, they can't be evalu evaluated under any other IEP, if they're if they receive one of these the one of these diagnoses, they can't receive services or. I mean, uh, these kind of symptoms may be there, may be unnoticeable or yes. barely there. So the problem is getting them counseling is getting hard because unless they are diagnosed, there is no follow up. Yes. So that's when you refer to care. <laughs> that's what we do. And we can work, you know, we can help with documentation. We, when we get a referral, we do, well, I'm going to talk about how we assess for these symptoms. We can, we do a, a full workup, write up, and all of this can be provided to the school, uh, to the IEP team, and we often make recommendations as to accommodations. So we do all that's a very much a big part of what we do. Thank you for that. Because grown up, we have no problem. <laughs> there, is, there are services available, counselors available, social workers. But for the kids, yeah, I think uh, there is lack of services. I mean, not many, but especially below seven minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. No, you're you're completely right. We don't we don't see uh, patients who are below like, the age of seven. Usually, our youngest is twelve, but we can always help with refer with with referring to different specialties within UCSD. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I have a question from one of our Zoomers. Uh, sure. The question is, so a kid having an imaginary friend can be an early warning sign? Um, the answer is it can be an early warning sign and it might not be an early warning sign. Uh, a lot of these symptoms are very common in children to have imaginary play, to, it's actually a normal part of development, to, um, you know, uh, pretend play or make up play. That's not, that in, its, in and of itself is not an early warning sign. Um, if you tell me that these 10 kids all have imaginary friends, I probably wouldn't, there would be no reason to refer, unless you see a constellation of symptoms, of other things combined, like I have an imaginary friend and I talk to this friend, and this friend tells me what to do, and I do it. Okay, th we wanna talk to that kid. Does that make sense? So it's a little bit beyond what you would consider regular imaginary play or fantasy for children. Thank you. Of course. And we go through all of that too. We don't um, just look at one symptom or two symptoms. We look at 
the symptoms as well as some of these behavioral changes that are very indicative of a decline in functioning. I saw a hand towards the back. Oh, I was going to ask, is there a, a maximum age of the individual that we accept into the program? Um, our, we usually max out around 35, but we can refer to um, other specialties in UCSD, like a more chronic clinic. We're all early psychosis, but we definitely assist with that, like when we have our patients who are aging out. Sometimes it's hard to transition because we have, you know, we try to have a good rapport with them. So we do um, keep patients, and that's kind of why you hear about that 35 number, is usually early onset is like early 20s, late teens. Um, so well, let's talk a little bit more about the early warning signs. Um, these are examples, and again, not one or two of these just indicates, uh-oh, you know, huge red flag. But we're going to give you some examples so that, you know, in the future, if you ever encounter this or if there's someone you're working with now, you can have a better understanding. Um, so we hear a lot about, and these are the clinical high risk, okay, so this is that high risk category. We hear a lot about unusual thoughts. Um, for example, concerns about being watched. That, and some of these, the, most of these, there's some like reality base to it, right? Because we've got Zoom, we've got Big Brother, we've got social media, we've got all this stuff, right? So there is some like, ooh, if I Googled that, it showed up on my browser. You know, there's some, <laughs> that happens to me too. So, you know, in and of itself, that's not, there, there's some like normal kind of um, typical response, but this is a little bit more. This is maybe people are watching me through the camera, and even though I cover my camera, I still think they might be watching me. The difference between a person in the clinical high risk category and psychosis is this word we use a lot, insight. If a student or a patient still has insight and they are questioning whether these symptoms are real or not, they're typically in the high risk category. When they lose insight, if I were to use that same example of someone who was thinking, you know, someone's watching through the camera, I know you all are watching through the camera right now. <laughs> uh, but with that example, if you take it a little bit further and this person saying, I am sure that I'm being watched. The CIA is after me. Um, I am 100% convinced. And no contrary evidence or information can sway that person. So we want to know, have they lost insight? If they've lost that insight piece, we will often see behaviors that are sort of bizarre or um, maybe even troublesome, you could say. For example, we've had patients, you know, cover every single window, don't leave their room, um, you know, these kind of like safety behaviors, we'll see those. Uh, maybe pay students who go and have kind of episodes on campus even, and they're ranting against someone, thinking that they're against them. These are some of the behaviors we see when they've lost insight. Any questions about that insight? So as a provider, when you know you have um, a member of patient or a client who has lost insight, when you're questioning them or trying to gather information, how do you go about, is it the same thing as like with dementia or Alzheimer's where you go along with what their reality is? Yeah, you know, it depends, and pretty much. So every, it's different with every patient, but what I typically do is I use a very, I, I question a lot. Okay, so you think, I, I, I'm thinking about one of my patients right now. So you think that 
these people from out of state are coming to get you. What makes you think that? And they might give me the information, well, I saw this on Instagram and I saw this. And sometimes if you, if you shut it down, we're, there's probably not gonna be much communication after that. And they're gonna go, they may even think that you're also one of the ones that's against them. So what I typically do is I kind of will dip my toe in the water a little bit and see like, well, what if this might just be in your mind? Or could it be? And I try to see those that tell me no, like absolutely not. I usually will back off, especially in the beginning of treatment, just so that I can do a full assessment and figure out what we need to do here. And so that, and these, this can often be before medications have really um, taken effect and things are stabilized. So I know that that's probably coming. Some of that insight is coming, but right now we don't have it and it's not gonna get us very far if I completely challenge this delusion. Right. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. Yes. Um, another, another warning sign is ideas of reference, which are beliefs that the computer or television or radio is communicating directly to someone. Um, the common example I hear a lot in group is The Office, that show where they're talking and then all of a sudden it's like pan to the camera and they start talking into the camera. It's, it's just one example, but oftentimes patients will say to me, no, they're, like, they're talking to me. This isn't, this isn't like they're talking to an audience, they're, they're talking to me. I think I had someone just yesterday who might have been um, sharing that with very little insight that that probably wasn't true. There sometimes is confusion about what is real versus what is imaginary. Uh, just yesterday I had someone saying that they, they're pretty sure that they're not real. Everything around them that's happening, these are all actors. Um, they're pretty sure they're not real. And some of the early signs that they exhibited was like feeling that they didn't fit in, feeling that others didn't accept them. Those were like the elementary school signs. So those are some of the ones we see early on and then might progress. Perceptual disturbances are maybe seeing things in the corner of the eye, hearing sounds, um, hearing buzzing in the ear. Those aren't uncommon. That doesn't mean that psychosis is happening. Those are early warning signs of this like clinical high risk category. Um, and then very importantly, behavioral changes. We want to look at the person's functioning. Are they socially isolating? Has there been a change in, you know, bathing, daily hygiene? Um, do you notice an increase in these checking behaviors? Really, we want to look at what change. Well, is there a difference from how this person was functioning before? This can come up a lot in class. Concentration changes. Just an A student. Just not being able to treat, not being able to meet deadlines or turn things in. Um, and we have a couple scales that we look at. Yeah. I have uh, two questions from Zoom. Um, the first one being, is clinical high risk when the subject has insight or is that psychosis? Wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, the first question is, is clinical high risk when the subject has insight or is that psychosis? So the subject has insight when it's the clinical high risk. Psychosis is when there's, the insight there is not there. And the second question is, uh, what does one say when we encounter a client expressing these things? Um, you know, I would, from a very non-judgmental place, you know, just ask. Ask about, hey, I noticed, I noticed I haven't seen you out as much. No, what's been going on? Um, I'm here to support you if, if you need anything. Um, yeah, these are, it depends, of course it depends what your role is, right? If you're a parent, if you're, if you're um, a counselor,
But I think, you know, very non-judgmental, um, being curious about the person's experience, maybe what you can do to help, and then providing some resources. You know, the contact to places like us, or there's a county program that um, also sees clinical high risk. There's hotlines through, if you've heard of NAMI, which is National Alliance on Mental Illness, they can call, chat, um, te text 24 like seven. So there's a lot of resources out there. So if there is an adult who is in psychosis, but not seeking treatment, will they eventually come out of the psychosis or are they gonna be in it indefinitely in one way or another? The symptoms can go, you know, we don't, everyone's different. The symptoms can go up and down. Um, without treatment, we don't see as, as positive of um, outcomes. So we do have some people who could return to some type of functioning, but maybe we'll have some residual symptoms that are untreated. It typically isn't a mental illness that goes away just on its own once it's psychosis. And the more times that a person's been hospitalized, the more um, florid psychotic episodes they have, the more likely it is that they'll have them in the future. a little video here on um, a kid, a real um, patient who was experiencing some of these early warning signs. And this is pretty common type presentation that we see at our clinic. So we're going to watch that and then I can answer questions. Is there a speaker that goes? I talk a lot, so oh, it's not um, in the corner. Oh, the computer. Oh, oh I see. I see. Okay. Well, hopefully, if not, he's just right next door. So we oh, can grab it. wonderful. Thank you so much. Communication difficult. Oh, there we go. Okay. Maybe a little lower. <laughs> person comes into our program, they're experiencing for the first time some symptoms of an unusual nature. This can sometimes be uh, perceptual experiences like hearing or seeing things that other people don't see or hear. Additionally, um, feeling perhaps uh, in danger by people around them, sometimes even people who are very close to them and that they care very much about in their lives. Uh, occasionally, the young people we work with are having some communication difficulties, either with expressing themselves or understanding what other people are trying to say to them. Uh, occasionally, young people struggle with having unusual thoughts or ideas and starting to view the world in a way that's different than their, than their typical selves. Um, you know, everyone experiences these types of uh, things from time to time, but we start to become concerned about them when they start to cause disruption in our day-to-day -day lives. 
when someone experiences the onset of these symptoms, that they, they don't always have the insight or judgment to recognize that they are becoming ill. So unfortunately, it often takes many, many months before people receive appropriate treatment. And uh, that's one of the challenges in, in managing this phase of illness, because we believe that the longer someone goes without getting the right treatment, uh, the more difficult it can be to bring about the best possible treatment response. So, you know, part of our effort is to try to educate people in the community as to how to recognize the early signs of an illness like this and that it is an illness and that people do need help from a mental health professional. When young folks are preoccupied with symptoms, they're unable to do the things in life that are making them happy. Uh, that includes uh, doing well at school and having relationships, uh, building friendships, experiencing things that teenagers and young adults are supposed to be doing at this stage in their life. Um, and when, when illness hits, unfortunately, it knocks people off that trajectory. And so the earlier somebody presents to us, the earlier somebody is asking for help, the better we can ensure that they stay on that track for themselves and they continue to achieve all those hopes and dreams that they have for themselves, continue to achieve all those developmental milestones. There are many different ways to get into our program. One is by reaching out. Uh, an individual can reach out themselves. By... Okay, so those, that went over some of the early warning signs, but I also have um, Michael's story, and it's right here on the side, so I'll just go ahead and show that one. And this is this is a real patient who's had uh, I think early warning signs. people don't really understand, um, normal people who don't, you know, have experiences with these type of things, is um, that me personally, I had no idea what was going on. It's not like I became angry at something, or that something that something had really happened to me um, happened to me that was emotionally um, devastating. It was just like I lost lost touch with reality. I had been a normal kid, uh, happy-go-lucky. You know, my friends would poke fun at me because I was always smiling, I was making jokes, and I was the most upbeat. And then in a matter of days. Like my mom said, everything became sort of, it felt like reality that I, the reality that I had known was, was distant. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't communicate. I was, at that point, hearing voices. Um, yes. Uh, mainly in music. I don't know how to explain it, but um, the song the song lyrics would change, uh, and they would say hateful things, racist things, homophobic things. They would tell me to harm people. They would talk about harming people, um, and I really didn't know how to vocalize it because I think any rational person would be like, "You're making this up. This isn't this isn't true." Andrew. You know, it's sort of like the boy who cried wolf. Um, so I figured I wouldn't cry because no one was going to come for me. So did anybody ever come up with a diagnosis here? At that point, um, it was determined that Andrew had um, psychosis, otherwise unspecified. And that was in, in June of 2008. And he was in the hospital for about five days. And he came home and he was um, better after receiving some medication and he was seen by a psychiatrist for several months and then um, he, um, he went off his medication after about six months and about three months later without any other form of treatment, no more visits to the psychiatrist no more talk therapy, he had his um, the second psychotic break. So uh, eventually, Andrew, did they tell you what what you had, what, what you were suffering from? Yeah, I, um, 
My family and I met with uh, a psychiatrist um, at UCSF, and after one meeting, probably 30 minute meeting, um, he uh, decided that I had schizophrenia. Um, and I was, uh, I didn't feel very good about this diagnosis because I, undisclosed psychosis was, uh, it, it sounded 10 times better than schizophrenia. When I thought of schizophrenia, I thought of um, teenagers, you know, beating up people and, you know, breaking laws and acting like hooligans in, in a way, um, you know, out of control. Um, and that certainly wasn't me. Um, I was never physically aggressive, um, sometimes frustrated, um, but I never heard anyone um, in my uh, in my experiences with psychosis um, or otherwise <laughs> yeah but you said that when you were hearing voices especially in the song they're yeah. kind of urging you on to some sort of physical yeah um, but I my, my parents brought me up well and I knew that this is something that's totally unacceptable in society in society to hurt anyone um, and so I resisted uh, these messages that uh, I thought were being sent to me. Um, and uh, okay, so right there is his insight. He is having those symptoms, but he is saying, "I knew that that is not appropriate to act on. I knew the difference between right or wrong, and I wasn't. He wasn't just listening to the voices and." Uh, have, they didn't have control over you know, his behaviors. He had control. And he had control over, he knew that it wasn't real. Okay, so let me, question, yeah, oh, let me. Yes. I have a few more questions from Zoom. Sure. Um, they're all kind of related, these three questions. Um, the first one being, the psychosis needs to be initiated within the subject with no external stimuli, uh, stimuli or can they be exposed to something that triggers it? Um, government, conspiracy, rapture, anxiety, etc. Um, and someone asked about maybe substance-induced um, psychosis and the third person more specifically asked about marijuana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Dr. Merzikhanian is going to talk about this a little bit more as well. Um, what we understand from psychosis is typically there's some type of vulnerability combined with some type of stress. Those, those things collide and we get uh, this mental condition. As with a lot of mental conditions, you know, it's, if, if our parent has major depression, we're a little bit more vulnerable to have major depression. So again, these things are not, it doesn't mean that if a parent has this that you will for sure, um, but there is some genetic vulnerability that we see. And then combined with the stress, stress is things like childhood trauma, um, upbringing, this could be also substance use, this could be bullying. So essentially you have a bit of a vulnerability, you combine it with some stress, and together we have a bit of a problem that comes up. When you say vulnerability, do you mean like vulnerability in the brain where your brain is, is just gonna be more, um, like what you're saying if something is previous and your parent has it or something, your brain's vulnerable, or just feeling vulnerable in your current like, situation? It's the, the first, okay. where it's a genetic vulnerability. So the chance of psychosis in the, app, in the general population is one out of 100. If a first degree parent has it, it's one out of 10. If a sibling has it, I think it's like 40% chance, I think. So, you know, again, doesn't equal disease, but it could be, you know, we, we want to watch those people and know that they have a bit of a vulnerability. Other questions? I know we're getting close to our break here. Um, this talks about some of the functional declines 
that we often see, so we kind of already talked about that. Um, but yeah, we'll go forward and talk about how we assess, because I think this is important. When we get a referral to care, we assess using a number of instruments. We do a full clinical interview, so you know, 90 minutes, we meet with the patient, we meet with the parents if at all possible, we try to get collateral information, because sometimes the accounts can be, you know, we need to kind of hear from different people oftentimes. Um, we'll look at records, hospital records, um, records of, of previous psychotherapy, we'll get releases for all of that. Um, and then we've got some psychosis specific related scales. Um, the SIPS is kind of the gold standard for identifying the clinical high risk. And um, we specialize in, in the SIPS. It's mainly, it's six primary scales, five primary scales with different anchors. Um, and so that's kind of, we've already sort of talked about that briefly. But we use the SIPS. Um, the BPRS, which is a brief psychiatric rating scale. There's the PANS, which is positive and negative syndrome scale. And then of course these functioning scales, we look at these, the social and role functioning. And then there's also a screener that we can use in this type of a setting where um, it just sort of flags for any symptoms that we might be concerned about. And we're going to be handing that out as well. Um, so a lot of times when you do, do the mental health fairs and things, we'll hand that out and see if, if any of these symptoms come up. Um, okay, so the PQB is a 21 item scale. Um, it asks about experiences as well as distress that is associated. It comes up with sort of a number and that helps us, yeah, we'll pass that around. That's the actual PQB. This is three samples from it. Um, so for example, do familiar surroundings sometimes seem strange, confusing, threatening, or unreal? And it will ask you yes or no. And so if yes, then it will ask you basically how distressed you are about it. When this happens, I feel frightened, concerned, or it causes problems for me. And it's this scale of strongly agree, disagree, neutral, agree, or strongly agree. So it's this 21 scale, 21 item scale, and it also covers things like hearing unusual sounds, um, perceptual abnormalities that we may not even think to bring up in conversation, like do things look brighter or duller or different? We often hear about these visual changes. Um, and so it, again, is going to assess whether they have these, and if yes, um, how distressed they are by them. Then we get a score. Um, so if they say no, it's zero. It's, it's, it's not um, scored. But if they do have any of these items, one through 21, they get a one, and that would be if they endorsed it. So we get how many items they endorse, and then also their distress level. So their distress score, um, you know, you might have someone who's like not distressed by these things, not upset by these things, uh, but usually there's some uh, elevation on the distress score. So if a student or patient um, endorses three or more positive symptoms, or so three out of the 21, or if there's a distress score of six or more, we would want to further evaluate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There Michael's student, Michael's story. So we have, a, yes. I'm oh, sorry, quick, quick, go to the PQD. Is this something that anyone could ask them or is this only a licensed professional should be doing this sort of evaluation? This is something that anybody can ask them. You can hand out the screener. This could be available to in the yes. health center. Um, we have website. a QR code with it. At the website? On our website. It's on our website. And then if you take the um, 
Sir, if you take the measure on the website, it will ask you if you want to be contacted. When I've done the fairs, I've handed these out, and if students want us to, we'll all say, you know, if you want to talk privately, why don't you go ahead and put your name and your email or your name and your number on top, and we, we you know, do that separately. So this is a screening tool, so it's not a diagnostic tool, right? So that's why anyone can actually um, just self-administer it as well. Did you say if they do the online survey, there's a way in which they can request to be contacted? Is that what they do? Yes. We have a newsletter that goes out. We have a number of online resources that students can, can look at and then ask to be um, contacted, ask to receive further information. Other questions? I know I threw a lot of information out there. Uh, it's definitely something I could talk about for days, so I won't put you all through that, um, but hopefully covered some of the highlights of what to look for what psychosis is, um, and we'll talk more, Dr. Merzakani will talk more about what do we do from there. All right, well thank you so much. I think we're gonna have a little break now, and uh, yeah, we'll be back in five minutes. All right everyone, we're gonna get started with the second portion. Uh, we have a lot to cover today. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right, we heard from uh, Dr. Corbett about some of the early warning signs as well as the, some of the symptoms that usually occur during a psychotic episode, during an acute episode. So, and I think one of the reasons why we were asked to come here is, so what do we do when we know that an individual has some symptoms that is not feeling well, and how do we get them help? So that is the million dollar question, and I wish I had a magic wand or something where we can say, okay, this is what you do, A, B, and C, and then, you know, they can get better and get treatment. Unfortunately, it's not as easy. And uh, like in, with anything in psychology or in psychiatry, it always depends on the individual, on the environment, on the symptoms. So, but there are certain things that we can do. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges and I think what, what is important and what we have learned both through research as well as through our clinical work is that we have to address some of these barriers, that some of these challenges that come up um, and uh, interfere with individuals actually looking um, to seek help. So some of these challenges, of course, are loss of insight into the condition, and that's something that Dr. Corbett talked about. If we don't know that we are not doing well, we are not gonna go and get help, right? If we think everything is all right, um, which happens when we have psychotic symptoms and we everything just makes sense to us, the logic to us, to the individual, makes absolute clear sense. It might not make sense to the other people, but to us it does. And that's why it's so difficult to also kind of argue or challenge, and we recommend not to do that with an individual who has a fixed idea or a delusion. Because just imagine you, be you believe in something, and I come to you and say, that what you really firmly believe in, and you, know, you have all these reasons and explanations, that's not real. You know, that's not real. The voices that you're hearing, no, that's not real, what do you mean? But no, I hear them, but I, it, that really feels real to me. So, it's not that easy to start and help these individuals in that moment. And we really don't want to just come and say, no, no, you know, that's what you're experiencing doesn't make sense. You know, you're sick, you need to get help, okay? Um, of course, we know that these individuals really w need to get help to recover because we also know that you can recover from psychotic symptoms 
and you can, if you are in the prodromal or at the risk period, we can intervene whether we delay the onset of psychotic symptoms or whether we actually intervene early enough so that they don't happen. Okay? So loss of insight is one of these things and that is why we want early intervention where the individual has still a little bit reality testing, that's what we call it, that is able to say, okay, you know what, you're right. If, if they were really out to get me, they would have been out here already, right? So maybe you are right, maybe they are not out to get me. Okay, so that doubt, instilling that doubt is something that we want uh, in the long term, that's what we do in therapy, for example. Okay. We all know, um, also know that um, the uh, psychotic symptoms, even at the sub-threshold level, at the at-risk level that we were um, uh, talking about, are associated with cognitive deficits. So even individuals who have not had an acute psychotic episode, and maybe 16, but have these sub-threshold symptoms of psychosis, but have still insight, they show signs of cognitive deficits. So we know that um, verbal learning, for example, is a little bit lower. So we have a lot of evidence that cognitively, that there are certain, um, certain very early signs that suggest that, uh, that are associated with psychotic-like symptoms. In addition to kind of those cognitive symptoms of attention and memory, we also see a lot of symptoms that we, um, in neuropsychology, we kind of uh, talk about as executive function. So things like reasoning, decision making, everything that our frontal lobes usually are responsible for. And I think what is important is to kind of consider that we're talking about adolescents here, okay, and young adults. Their frontal lobes and the executive functioning is already not full, fully de developed, right? So you add symptoms to it, you add the vulnerability to it, and sometimes you add the other risk factors to it, which is kind of drug use. And, and so you see how you know your the the brain can get into imbalance, and how that can impact all these different areas of your functioning. Um, oftentimes, another way students or other individuals have a hard time getting treatment is because of their paranoia, right? So I think Dr. Corbett mentioned that a little bit in that, you know, I don't trust you. Paranoia starts usually out with some suspicion, some mistrust in people. And so how can I trust you that you have my best interest in mind? Why should I come to you? for example. And so all these things can impact how, how, how um, easily or you know, uh, an individual will seek uh, treatment. And then we of course have uh, stigma associated with mental health in general, but especially with also seeking help, right? So those are important things that we are going to try to address. And as, as counselors, as you know, you know, friends, uh, if you can actually help at any point, um, if you can address some of those, identify some of the challenges, and then try to address them and demystify them. So usually the goal of the initial contact um, is to establish rapport, okay? So we do, we spend a long time connecting to patients, okay? Even, even the ones who come in with acute symptoms, um, it's, it, it can't be something where you say, okay, I'll see you in five minutes and then you're done, and then go and take this meds and we're good. That's not how this works. So you really need to connect with people and build rapport. Uh, you have to, one way to do that is also kind of describe the key elements um, that are available to the, to the, to the 
to the students. So you want to make sure that when students come to you and have questions or you know that there is something you know it's bothering you that you know what resources are out there and how you these resources can actually help them so the point is to focus on recovery and not necessarily on disease not necessarily oh something is wrong with you and you need help right now but well things have changed you just told me that you know you're struggling with this let's see how we can make this you know go away okay so there's a difference and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. So it is important when you have a student in your office to identify whether they have any other uh, support. So one important uh, research finding we have is that if an individual, if a patient has family support, then their prognosis and overall treatment will be much more uh, positive. Um, so this is really, really important. So a lot of the times when the individual themselves has, has lost touch with reality and is refusing or has a hard time coming in to treatment, it's the parents that come in or it's the, it's the girlfriend that brings them in or the grandmother that brings them in or the roommate. And those are also the individuals who also notice some of the unusual changes in the person happening and can identify the early warning signs okay so it really takes it's very hard for just the individual to do that by themselves so you really need to have a support group um, so early on identifying whether any of your students will have that other person would be really really important um, you need to kind of address where they are and just their interest in the student's interest in seeking help, right? And it can be that they have no interest because they are really psychotic and they don't have insight, right? But there is usually something that can help you kind of hook them in, okay? So it's really important to see the person as the person and not the symptom or the illness. All of us will have some issue at some point in our lives that will impact things that are relevant to us, right? If I feel depressed, that it might be that it impacts my family. So the way to get to me, help ask for, like for me to ask for help is to say, well, you really love spending time with your family. And because of your depression, you haven't been spending time as much with your family as you wanted to. Wouldn't you want that to change? Right? So you, you want to give the individuals, um, the, the students who come in, uh, something that is relevant, something that they can understand that they want to regain, that they have lost. And I think what is really, really important is to kind of keep in mind that individuals and families are often in crisis during the early stages um, of engagement. Okay, so, uh, and it's just very difficult. It, it feels like a trauma, it feels like a shock when, um, when a member of your family is starting to act, you know, bizarrely up there talking if things these things happen it just feels like the rug was pulled out of your feet and in those moments people families and the individual will be in crisis mode right so it's important to keep that in mind as well that um, it, it will take some time for the families of your students to also kind of be on the same page to you know um to uh, to be able to even hold all those uh, all that information that that you may be um, giving them, and to for them to regain that hope that yes something can be done. So what we usually do, in addition to uh, of course to a full assessment. Um, we often provide psychoeducation to our uh, patients and when we go and do outreach that's one of the most important things that we do 
And by psychoeducation, it's just exactly what we did and what Dr. Corbett did earlier. It's just talk about that there, it's a, that there is a spectrum of psychosis illness, that it can start early with some symptoms that are kind of, you know, very nonspecific, and then there are certain aspects and certain risk factors that can add on to it, such as substance use, trauma, or other things. And imagine going off to college, okay? Being in high school and then going off to college. I mean, that's a big change, right? These transitions are really, can be very stressful. And that stress can be the one that tips, basically, uh, uh, is the, the tipping point for this individual. And so uh, we, we have, we have so in, in providing them that information that there is a that there is a whole spectrum and that you, you may be here but let's find out where you are let's find out at what stage you are and let's get help okay so and it's not very different than um, any other medical condition when we when we talk about diabetes or when we talk about heart disease or cancer right I mean, we want to intervene early, right? That's why we do all these tests. We don't wait until cancer is at stage four and then say, oh, let's intervene now. And oh, I'm sorry, you know, it's too late, right? So this is important. Having that type of a mentality and having that way of thinking about mental health and especially psychosis as well, that it is something that is a spectrum that starts early and there are stages and you can intervene at different stages it's just that at different stages, you may your treatment may be at a different uh, level, okay? And to also keep in mind that even if you are, if you have individuals who have these acute psychotic symptoms, they can recover, okay? And I was going um, around and I heard someone ask Dr. Corbett, what are your top three kind of cases of individuals who have recovered? Well, we have a lot of these. We see a, so a lot of our um, of population that we see are young adults who go off to college, whether it's community college or it's UCSD or Berkeley or whatever, wherever, and then they have a psychotic episode because it's a big transition. Because they, for the first time they tried drugs or they realize that they can't take more Adderall and that will help them. And then they're all by themselves, maybe somewhere else, and this happens. So a lot of our patients then are students who come back to their family home, which is sometimes you know, in San Diego, and when they're in our treatment, you can see how after a while they get better. And we have, we have students who have gone back. We have students who have graduated. We have students who um, are in law school and nursing school in you know, different you know, places. And that's, I think, the important thing to be able to instill that in your students, that just because you're not feeling well now doesn't mean that you will end up like the stereotype that we have of schizophrenia on the streets, that we can actually help you and you can get back on your feet and go and do what is really important to you, okay? And so that's, I think, and that's something kind of what is underlying that it is important to highlight that all the services are based on a recovery-oriented model and that they're designed to help your students, adolescents and young adults, to reach your optimal level of functioning, okay? And we are, we are that this, um, you know, kind of psychosis research is still pretty new and about, you know, 20, 30 years ago, people didn't think that you can actually recover from psychosis. So for a lot of people, the idea was that, you know, if, you, if they thought about psychosis, it was, you know, schizophrenia, it was chronic, okay? That's what they imagined. But we now know that that's not the case. And to be able to also um, share that with your students, that, well, we, you know, we can get, get you back on your feet. Okay. And so, and one thing that I think um, is important is 
Um, when you see your when you see your students, kind of identifying what it is that is really important to them. And I talked about that about that relevance before, but it's really important um, because that is what can get them really really interested. So if if you talk to them about getting um, so they they don't believe in the CIA coming after them, that might not be their big issue in that moment. Okay. But their big issue might be, in fact, that their belief in the, in the CIA actually interferes with them going out or going, uh, or going to school. And so you want to tell them, OK, your goal is to actually go back to school or go socialize again. Let's find ways to help you with that. Okay. So it doesn't become about the CIA and their symptoms and that something is wrong with them, but about what they want to achieve and how we can get them to that point. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the cognitive development. Um, do you see in your guys' practice a lot of um, students who have um, like uh, autism diagnoses or things like that? There is a there is some overlap. Yes. So we actually have a group of uh, you know individuals who who have both who have the comorbidity with autism, yes. Would that be considered as part of that, that cognitive development that adds the extra vulnerability? Could be, could be, you know. Um, the, if the vulnerability that we're talking about can be, so um, we, we didn't talk about kind of the ideology of like how, uh, you know, psychosis emerges or what we think, the mechanism. It's, you know, we think that it can start very, very early on and sometimes even during pregnancy. And that there are certain neurodevelopmental, we're thinking of schizophrenia or psychotic illnesses now more as a neurodevelopmental um, disorder that, um, and we're doing a lot of research on inflammation and neuroinflammation. So um, it, it's not exactly clear what it is that leads to an individual having psychotic symptoms or becoming psychotic or going on to <coughs> have schizophrenia. Um, because just because you have psychotic symptoms doesn't mean you will have schizophrenia. Um, but there is a combination of things, yes. So, um, and, and you're absolutely right. At what point is it that the, the you know, we're talking about during the development of the brain, um, you know, um, in, in terms of like pruning what what you know what happens and what areas get you know continue being online and which ones you know yeah. don't yeah. Thank you. I have a question regarding uh, the approach for the treatment wise like schizophrenia mm -hmm. and other uh, borderline personality sometimes they are induced as you said through the drug abuse or maybe a brain injury, mm -hmm. like accidents, or acute stress of somebody, something happening to them, or they witness something. So when when the diagnosis comes to that level, like it is proven that the MRI image scanning for the schizophrenic brain, equal to TBI brain, shows the same thing. But well, if yes it is, no. Yeah, but if it is a TBI, it's all the brain degeneration is already there. There's nothing can be done other than prolonging the patient. So one side it shows that there is a hope to cure. Other side it says that he, the client has to live with it. So we have to give them uh, tools to learn to deal with it. No, absolutely, it and we will yes, and we will talk about that. Uh, so and about kind of the treatment option. And you're right. So part of it is not that. You, that the individual will be symptom free, okay? And this is with any other illness, okay? Even if you have back pain, doesn't mean that if you do that surgery, your back pain will go away entirely, right? Yeah. It's just that you will, it might get less and you will learn how to deal with it. And similar things happen when you have psychotic symptoms or you know any type of psychotic disorder that it might not be that it goes away entirely. You may always be a little bit suspicious but you will learn the tools to say, hmm, this seems familiar to me. Let me 
let me just check in and do a reality check to see that whether that's really happening or whether it's my brain playing tricks on me. Okay? So yes, absolutely. You know. Um, and so and, and another thing that uh, you know um, I wanted to mention, and I'm guilty um, here as well because we. When we, when we learn, when we start talking, when, you know, everything uh, has been in a, in a kind of a deficit type of approach, right? When, you know, the first class you take in psychology that talks about mental health issues, it's called abnormal psychology. You know, I mean, just, just think about it, how much stigma there is already associated with that. And a lot of the language we use is deficit-based language, right? So um, hopefully not as much anymore, but we do say a schizophrenic or a psychotic, right? So those like if patients come to us and say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm schizophrenic, and it just hurts me because that's they identify with that already, right? right? And that just can impact their outcome. Okay, and so there are ways that you can turn this into a strength-based and recovery-oriented um, model, and that can make a really big difference in how how open your students will be to reach and seek help. It'll change the way they um, they want to seek you know uh, services. Absolutely, yes. So because. If I think about I'm suffering from something, that suffering makes me feel like I'm, I'm stuck, I'm suffering, right? But I, if I think about working to recover from, right, it's, it's a different trajectory, right? Even, as you said, living with it is different than suffering from it, right? So I think these are, this is just like a few things, a, a few of these type of uh, words and language we use, and I think it would be really important to kind of get into this habit to see whether we can rephrase how we talk. Okay? Um, yeah, so things like weaknesses, you know? I mean, I'm a neuropsychologist, and we talk about strengths and weaknesses, you know? And like, weaknesses seems like it's a weakness, you can't do anything about it, right? But if I talk about it in terms of, oh, there's a barrier, and, and you can add, you know, address the barrier, and then it can change, and you can, you know, you can do something with it, right? Um, I like the uh, main t- or is the non-compliant medications, the uh, strength-based approach to that, for alternative coping strategies. That is more empowering for the, um, for the, the member patient, um, and so they're saying that they're not compliant, but it's because they have the choice to, to exactly else. Exactly. And I think one may, maybe the most important message as part of what I, you know, part of this segment is that you wanna you want to instill that there is a choice. You wanna instill that yes, there is there are ways to do this. And um, and so um, <coughs> You can give them what you think is the right thing to do, based on research, based on your knowledge, right? But it's important to give the individual the choice, okay? Because then they're more likely to actually listen to you, okay? So I mean, we all have heard no's before, right? Can I have this? No. What the, what is it? We want that, right? Exactly what we're so told not to have, right? So giving choices, empowering the student that they can take their health and mental health in their own hands, and that you're there as an advocate, okay? You're there to help them. Now, of course, there are certain situations when people are a danger to themselves or to others. I'm not talking about those situations, right? So in those situations, then someone has to make a decision against the person you know, uh, will basically uh, to hospitalize them because there is danger. But it's not always that these situations are not often the case. Okay, when people come to us, there is, you know, 
we, we don't hospitalize individuals as frequently as you know, um, one would think, just because they have a psychotic illness. Okay. So um, there's some kind of ways that um, I think would be helpful to um, kind of refrain things. I just also mentioned it, like um, saying, asking the students, you know, and assessing where what they're thinking is is the problem. You know, so what do you think is going on? What is your belief system? Because you can actually get a lot of information from that. Okay. I don't know. I think I'm, I'm worried because I feel like, um, I don't know, God is talking to me. Okay. Well, maybe, right? That could be. So, um, how is that impacting you? What does your family think? Right? So, just, you know, and, and, and to, to kind of assess where the individual and their belief system is because that will also show you how convinced they are and in, in, in how fixed in the, their delusional system they are. Um, when you give them information as part of psychoeducation, for example, make sure that you give them in chunks, okay? So we just talked about that there are sometimes cognitive deficits, that's executive functioning deficits, so you don't want to overwhelm them. I mean, I'm overwhelming you all with talking a lot right now. I feel like there's a lot of, uh, what's going on, but um, just making sure that we ask them what they know, tell, ask them what they want to know, and then tell them in a way that they can understand. Okay, and then just using things like um, signposting or summarizing things like there are three important things that I want you to remember. Okay, I want you to go home today and I want you to tell your mom that you haven't been feeling so well. I want you to call your counselor and or email your counselor. And then I want you to come back to me in a week and we'll see what has happened. Okay. And then a lot of what we do is negotiation. <laughs> it is. We have to negotiate with our patients, with our families, with you know, and, and find a way to communicate and build that rapport and you know, uh, find a way to come to a mutual understanding and acceptable plan. Because if it's not a mutual acceptable plan, then it's not gonna be helpful, okay? So if, if, uh, if any, like any of us, if they, we go to a doctor and they say, here, this is the medication I want you to take it. Okay, some of us will take it, but some of us were like, uh, why, no, I mean, excuse me, right? <laughs> so I think that's the part where you kind of have to come, like, it has to be a process, a dynamic process, and you have to ask what the patient wants, and you have to say what you think is, you would do, what your recommendation is as the expert, but it has to come to agreement because otherwise there's not going to be any continuity because they will lose trust in you as whether it's a counselor or a physician or a psychologist or whatever or as a parent, right? So I think that's really important to kind of encourage them to contribute their thoughts. So, um, you know, uh, and do it in a more kind of suggestive and decision and a joint decision making way. Okay. Because there are always ways. So we have a lot of, you know, our, our young adults come in and they don't want to take antipsychotic medications because it, it has side effects, right? So it is important to mention what side effects it is that they're worried about. So what is it that concerns you most about taking this, right? Oh, it's the weight gain? Okay. Or for some individuals, it might be uh, against their belief system. Right? So you want to know that that is what it is and address that, okay? So you can decide as a psychiatrist, I may be able to give you this medication that has a little bit less you know, side effects in terms of weight gain than this one, okay? So there are options, and I think that's important for the individuals to also know. Um, and then at the end, I think it's really important to assess for barriers 
and that's when you say, so I know we just talked about you doing X, right? But do you think it is realistic for you to accomplish that in the next week? Right? Assess. And if it's not realistic, then how can we make it more realistic? Okay. As we all know, it's really hard to change old habits. It's it's hard to convince ourselves a, you know, a different way when we firmly believe in something. So we have to understand that it will take time, it will take repetition, and that you know there might be others who can help us do that. Okay. And I think I'm gonna stop here. I have this small reflection exercise. We can do that if you like. And then we'll be good on time for yours. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to think of a time when you were successful in making a change that you were previously not successful with. What did it take for you to make that change? And if you cannot think of such an instance, what is it? What what is keeping you from making the change that you want to make? And what would it take to motivate you to make that change? why this could be relevant to what we're talking about. past year 
every time you have been on the medication, you've actually done better. But you don't want to be on medication, okay? You need to talk with your prescriber and come up with an agreement, right? So if I if the prescriber says no, you can't be. I mean, they can they they can not take it, right? We know that they can stop not taking it. So it's important to come to a group agreement and say, okay, if you want to taper off, let's taper off during the time where I know that it's going to be least impactful on your academics, and I want to see you more. So this is where the negotiation happens. So know that if you stop take, uh, you start taking lesser dose, then you do have to come and see me more often, or you have to start going to therapy. Okay, so this is where the negotiations and the options happen. It's not a one or none thing, right? So there are options. And when you give people options, they're more likely to actually take an option, right? Okay, so any other questions before I uh, give the stage to Wendy? and I'm here to talk to you about stigma um, because we feel like we'll be doing everybody a disservice if we're talking about psychosis and schizophrenia with, without talking about stigma and mental illness. Um, so stigma is sticky. That's one of the most, actually this is a comment that I made individ, um, independently by several individuals when I ran a resistant self-stigma group on an inpatient unit. Can you guys think about why stigma may be, might be described as sticky for some of the people that had lived experiences with stigma. Any ideas? Yeah. Because uh, it's a label that sticks with you? It's a label that sticks with you. What else? Yeah. It's hard to remove. It's hard to remove. Perfect. You guys can give this talk for me. So this is um, one of the comments made by um, the group members. People just stick a label on me, and it's hard to shake off exactly what you guys just mentioned. So this process of stigmatization actually starts with the labeling, right? You are a person who hears voices. You are a person who is psychotic. But it doesn't stop there, right? It's not just a label. It's an ugly label. We associate that label with a negative and typically untrue stereotype. You have psychosis, and that is the future. And then that once we're lab someone is labeled with that ugly label, then we start to see them versus us. Then they start, start to experience that loss of social status, they start to experience discrimi discrimination. But it all starts with that ugly label. And it's not just an ugly label, it's a sticky label. We know that the adverse effects of stigma is very persistent and powerful. People actually talk about um, mental illness as a double jeopardy because the individuals experiencing mental illness do not only have to deal with the mental illness itself, but also the stigma that comes with it. And sometimes the stigma can be more detrimental than the illness itself. And for a lot of people, it's not just double triple jeopardy, it's more like triple quadruple jeopardy if they're living um, or belonging to multiple marginalized communities. And stigma is also sticky because this is another comment made by one of the group members. It's almost like guilt by association. People just do not want to have anything to do with me. And this person actually very, very accurately describes what we call in the literature stigma by association. So stigma does not only happen to the individual, but also the people around them. So stigma sticks to the people around them who are affiliated with them. And we're typically talking about family members, carers, or friends. And then we can start to think about how stigma affects the relationships between a stigmatized individual and their support system. And that's why stigma is sticky. So we sort of alluded this to already, you know, stigma, stigma really comes in different shapes and forms. It comes in at the structural level, right? It, um, and public stigma is kind of what we talk about when we talk about stigma, right? It comes in the form of misinformation, prejudiced attitude, and the actual acts of discrimi discrimination. We talk about stigma by association already. It's also known as affiliate stigma, courtesy stigma. But what's the most nasty things, I think, about stigma is we can internalize that. So that is the process how public stigma becomes self-stigma. 
and this drawing kind of accurately describes, or very vividly describes that process. So we start with the experience with public stigma, right? So people with schizophrenia do not have a future. That's an untrue belief. But then we internalize that. Oh, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia, or I start to experience psychosis, psychosis-like symptoms. Therefore, I must not have a future. And when people think like that, it's very start to it's very easy to start to have this why try mentality, right? If my future is doomed already, then why should I try making friends, forming relationships, or working hard in school, or trying to pursue a college education? And of course, with that mentality, we start to see disengagement from all these important activities. And then it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Start to see this decrease in role in social functioning. And then the person would think, see, I was right. I knew I wouldn't have a future. So that's why stigma can be so nasty. We internalize it and it really affects people. Um, we thought, you know, stigma is by definition, a cultural and social definition, a uh, construct, so we can't really understand the impact of stigma without um, understanding the social cultural context within which stigma happens. And this is um, the, the cultural framework called What Matters Most. And it describes the process of how stigma really exerts its core effect on these in, uh, stigmatized individual by taking away or threatening to take away what's most at risk, or most at stake, or what matters most in a local cultural context. So I would encourage you all to think about, for you or for the students that you work with, what matters the most for them? And those can be the first thing to go when they're subjected to those stigmatizing beliefs. So a lot of people talk about peer relationships, and if their community happens to be one that holds those stigmatizing beliefs, then they can exchange lots of social identity our social capital. And often people describe this process of losing friends because they came out as someone who has a mental illness diagnosis or someone who's seeking mental health treatment. Then that now becomes a very tricky decision. Do I tell people to ask for support or do I just hide it so that I do not risk losing these friendships? We talked about the stigma by association, so we have to think about what that means for, for the family. In a lot of cultures, um, the illness of an individual is the shame of the entire family, right? So people have to, again, deal with this um, tricky position of do I conceal it from my family to protect them and or to protect myself from being alienated by my family. Um, some people see the well-being of the children as um, a reflection of how well the parents raised them. Right? So when the children start to experience those mental health challenges, people start to blame the parents. Um, people have also described um, experiences um, of stigma at school. So that can be um, expressed in forms of fear, dislike, avoidance, or simply just underestimation of their true abilities simply because of the label that we put on them. And since we're talking about engaging students in care, and it, it, this graph is helpful um, to kind of remind us that help seeking is not one action, it's a multi-process, pro multi-stage process. So they have to uh, first experience mental health problems, right? Then they have to make um, a decision that I need help, right? That there needs to be this, this perceived need for professional help. Then we need to do this kind of calculation, is it worth it, right, to do the cost-benefit analysis. Then we need to seek care, then that's, that doesn't end there, right, people also need to stay in here. And then we can start to think about how stigma can affect every single stage of this process. So for many people, if they already have that perceived public stigma or self-stigma, you know, people who seek mental health treatment are the people who can take care of their life's problems then they're less, less likely to actually seek care. Many people experience this anticipated or actual negative experience of being labeled, of having a record, and that's something a lot of people are worried about. Um, shame and environments for the self and for the family. And also this experience of um, provider prejudice. So this um, diagnosis overshadowing describes the process where some providers can misattribute all symptoms to mental illness. And that can be very validating as well. 
And of course, there's the structural barriers. When we say structural barriers, we're talking about allocation of resources, which can result in inadequate quality of treatment. But we're also talking about news media, social media, and how they portray people with mental illness or how they tend to jump to the conclusion of mental illness when we see violence. And of course, stigma impacts health, health outcomes. And I wanted to draw attention to these groups who tend to be particularly vulnerable to the negative effects of um, stigma on health-seeking seeking behaviors. Young people, young people who live with parents with mental illness, people who belong to ethnic minority conditions, the uh, ethnic minority groups, and also, for the health professionals here, we are also vulnerable to this effect. And actually, there is a study that showed for people who are at high risk for developing psychosis, high stigma stress actually increases their risk of actually transitioning to schizophrenia. So this is real. How do we deal with it? Um, the EASE approach is helpful. Of course, all solutions come in acronyms, right? Okay. So educating. Um, it's not enough to educate others about the myths versus facts about schizophrenia. And hopefully today the presentations could help clear some of the myths about psychosis and schizophrenia. But it's also important to educate ourselves and engage in those type of, types of self-reflection and self-assessment. You know, what kind of biases do I hold about the people I serve? I remember when I was facilitating that um, anti-stigma group, I was constantly surprised by the depth and richness of the conversation we were having on that inpatient unit. And then I had to ask myself, what kind of expectations did I have about my patients? What kind of biased views might I have hold about my patients? So I encourage you all to constantly engage in this process of self-reflection assessment. Awareness. Um, let's label the experience of stigma what it is and let's really draw awareness for ourselves and for others um, to the effects of public stigma and self-stigma. Shifting the perspectives, it's helpful to shift the perspectives of people who might hold these views, right? You are someone who's experiencing symptoms of schizophrenia or psychosis. You are also a talented person, right? And lastly, empowering. And this is where kind of this drawing really um, becomes very helpful. Um, the nasty thing about stigma is it's a label, right? We put that label on you and that defines you. Um, so it just ha has this overwhelming experience that I am surrounded by my mental illness, that's all I am. But the matter of the truth, truth of the matter is mental health illness can just be a small part of one's identity. So part of that empowering process is really to highlight a person's strengths, values, interests, hobbies, and to build social connections for them. And that's really, I managed to miraculously finish it in uh, 15 minutes. Um, any thoughts, questions before I uh, release yourself, or you, you all to the lunch break? I have a question. Uh -huh. When you uh, mentioned about the providers trying to produce and uh, labeling, there is a practical thing goes on uh, in the community when uh, seeking uh, under the uh, treatment, suppose some client is qualified for the two, three units symptom is there. They are bumping it to eight to nine to get qualified for the insurance. Mm -hmm. And it does hinder them at some part of their life. Certain, certain kind of jobs require a psych evaluation or uh, uh, mentioning about have you ever experienced so and so and so and so. Mm -hmm. If you are experienced, out. You are not qualified for the job. That's the structural discrimination we're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But that's right. Thank you for drawing us to that. Okay, thank you all for your attention. Let's go for lunch. Okay. I know it's hard. There's, there's, there's really good food. Thank you for providing the food. Very nice. So, um, as I had mentioned in the beginning, we have Christine Frey here who will be introducing herself uh, in a little bit more detail, but she is one of the youth mental health advocates. And uh, she has, uh, she, and you, you will see, I mean, this is just incredibly impressive what uh, uh, Christine has been doing. And uh, um, without further ado, Ms. Christine.
Um, can you all hear me through the mask? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. First and foremost, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. My presentation for you all is called Brain XP's System of Hope Training. This is a mental health presentation, but more specifically focused on psychosis. I apologize, my service dog in training is here. Um, he might be a little chirpy, but we'll get through this. Um, yes, so I'm very excited to be here, and I'd like to get right on into it. Here's my beginning disclaimer. I'm not a mental health professional. My training is my lived experience. And I do believe, I do believe lived experience is some of the best training that you can have as a mental health advocate. So this presentation is not medical, it's based on lived experience. I'm going to give you a rundown of this training. There are four parts to it. After each part, I'm going to try to remember to ask if there are any questions, but the part four is about the Q&A. But just to give you a little bit of a rundown, in part one of this training, I'm going to share my mental health journey with you all. Everything about it, the childhood, the upbringing, all of my mental health challenges in middle school and in high school, the impact it had on everyone around me, as well as the creation of Brain XP. If you don't know what Brain XP is, it's the organization I founded about mental health. So you'll learn about that in this presentation too. In part two of this training, I will be sharing Brain XP's unique system of hope. It's a unique system that we kind of looked, my mom and I looked at how I made it through my challenges and became an advocate myself. And these are the steps in the system of hope of how I did it myself. So this is a sneak peek. This is my system for building a healthy mind, my secrets to finding courage within, my process for transforming interests into coping skills, and my strategies for becoming an advocate. This system is specifically designed for teens and transitional aged youth. I'm not sure if we talked about transitional aged youth yet, if you haven't been here, but it stands, TAY is what it stands for. Um, and it's usually the ages between 16 to 25. So it's a great college age range as well for most students. In part three of this training, I'm gonna tell you all about Brain XP, our website, our offerings, our community, and how you can join and be a part of it. And then in part four, we'll have a Q&A where you can ask me anything about my personal mental health experiences. I'm pretty much an open book, so even the embarrassing stuff I'm willing to share um, about Brain XP and our offerings. And just again, I'm not a mental health professional, so my answers are based on lived experience, not medical professional advice. Okay, let's get started. And part one is all about me. Um, so my name is Christine Marie Fry. In the world of Brain XP, my stage name or alias, whatever you want to call it, is Christine XP. So here's who I am today. I'm the founder of Brain XP. I'm an award-winning mental health advocate, an international award-winning teen author, a mental health blogger and vlogger, a mental health public keynote speaker. We're going to talk about coping skills in this presentation. One of my favorites is songwriting. So I like to include that I'm a songwriter and a musical recording artist. But out of everything on this list, if you could only take away one thing, I would appreciate you could take away that I'm my own mental illness warrior and survivor. Okay, so the first part is about my childhood when we're talking about my journey. The reason why I like to share about my journey is mainly because I have a hard time trusting people, especially someone that I don't know. So I wanna give you my background, everything that I've been through, so hopefully it builds some trust between all of you and myself. So my childhood, was maybe what someone would call close to ideal, if there's such a thing. I had a very supportive family, still do. I was a very happy kid. I was a straight A student. I had tons of friends. I was involved with everything, sports, extracurricular activities, talent show. I was very involved. I did have some things that maybe went unnoticed that ended up being anxiety symptoms. So for example, when I was young, I was a germaphobe. I couldn't, I just couldn't do germs. I couldn't let anyone touch my plate of food. I, I was really, really particular. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's anxiety, but for me, looking back on my, on my challenges as a child, they probably were signs of anxiety, now that I think back, but they were a little bit unnoticeable. So sometimes it's hard to see what's anxiety, what's being nervous. It's a little bit difficult sometimes. But going into middle school, that's when everything kind of changed for me. I started with anxiety. So when I got into sixth grade, 
I went on a sleepover at my best friend Bella's house, and I've been at her house, to her house several times. I mean, I'm talking like nearly a hundred times probably. Sleepovers, just hangouts, um, as well as other friends' sleepovers as well. I loved them. I had no problem with them. But on this one sleepover in sixth grade that I went on at her house, in the middle of the night, I got this pit in my stomach, and I didn't know what to do. I felt like I had no control over the situation or anything that was going on. I wanted to know what time we're waking up, what are we going to eat for breakfast tomorrow, what time, what time we're watching the movie tomorrow. All these questions just kept spiraling in my head, and because I'm at somebody else's house, I didn't have those answers right away. So because of that lack of control, and because of what I was feeling, that pit in my stomach and not knowing what to do, I told my best friend's mom, I said, I'm not feeling well, I need to go home. So my mom came and drove over to her house, picked me up literally at one in the morning, and brought me home. I was like, that was really weird. Why did that happen? That's never happened to me before. I'm like, okay, whatever. Maybe I wasn't feeling well. But then I went over to her house again, and again, and again. Three more times tried to do a sleepover, and I had to go home in the middle of the night because I was feeling some sort of way about this. I didn't know that that feeling was anxiety at the time, because I didn't learn about mental health in school. I wasn't sure what any of these terms meant and what feelings and emotions meant. So I discovered that what I was experiencing was anxiety. But basically, after I couldn't go on those sleepovers several times, my mom came to me and said, you know what? Why don't we try counseling or therapy? Or both, they're kind of the same thing. Um, and I was like, no, no, I'm not doing that. I, therapy is not for OK kids. That's not my thing. The reason why I had that initial instinct was because I was 11 years old, none of my friends were in therapy, I was not taught in school about therapy and that it's okay to go there to talk about your problems, I had a very stigmatic approach, even myself. So that completely changed, I will tell you, but at first, as a little 11 year old, I was like, I'm not about that therapy life. But I did end up going to therapy. And the reason for that is because, well one, I was a minor, my mom had the idea, I was going to therapy. Um, but two, I had a big, big thing coming up called sixth grade camp. So I started therapy in September of my sixth grade school year. Seven months later, there's a mandatory camping field trip that all sixth graders have to go on at my school. So I had a big problem. This camping trip is five sleepovers in a row. You're two to three hours away from home. You're with your classmates and your teacher. Your parents are not there. You have no cell phones or communication like that with people not on the trip. I couldn't go on one sleepover. How was I going to go on this mandatory field trip? So I started the counseling in September, like I said, and I worked there at that counseling center for seven months leading up to the trip. I learned how to start talking about my feelings. It was really difficult at first because I never talked about my problems before because I didn't really have so many problems. And it's just really very weird to open up about something like that, especially for the first time. But slowly, I think the first month of therapy, all we did was my therapist and I played board games. That was it, just eased me into it. And then I started to finally talk a little bit about what was going on. And then we did some cognitive behavioral therapy. So we talked a lot about my thoughts, connected to my feelings, connected to my actions. And that's really where I discovered that anxiety is, it's not, it's not a bad thing. It's just something that you have to learn to cope with. So, I mean, plenty of people have anxiety. It's about managing it. And that's what I learned in therapy. So when I got to the camping field trip, after all that work, I went on the trip, and I had the best time ever. It was so much fun. It was a complete success. I will not lie. I had tons of anxiety on that field trip. The difference was I knew how to cope with it because I'd been in therapy and I learned those skills. So it didn't just go away, but I just knew how to deal with it. So it was a fantastic trip. That was toward the end of my sixth grade school year. Toward the end of my sixth grade school year, I ended off the year with straight A's. All my friends were good with me. We were all having a great time. I was feeling really good going into the summer after sixth grade. Then the summer hit, and I broke my ankle for the second time. And I was on a competitive club soccer team at the time. So when I broke my ankle again, I had to leave my team. For anyone who's been a part of a club, sports team, or anything you know, competitive like that, I mean, I was with my teammates all the time for practices, tournaments, games, carpooling, traveling. We did everything together. So leaving the team, I lost like almost all of my friends on the team, which was really difficult for me. But it was the summer. I wasn't really in school to see anything happening. It was just, I dealt with my stuff myself that summer. But then I went into seventh grade, and some of the girls who were on my team also went to my school. 
So when I got into seventh grade, I'm now seeing the growth that these girls had made to with each other and how distant I'd become. And for me, that was enough to make me very sad. It was very hard to watch that at school now. Five days a week, seven, days, seven hours for those five days. So it was, it was not anyone's fault, it was not intentional, but it was right in my face all the time. Going into seventh grade, as I mentioned, I was not the happiest, so I started to, not really knowingly, but I just started to isolate and withdraw from everything. So, I mean, I think you can tell now I talk a lot, I like to talk, that's how I was before. Um, I talk all the time, but all of a sudden, like within a day, wouldn't talk unless someone spoke to me. Um, I would not raise my hand in class anymore. I would never answer questions. And I just started to isolate slowly, little by little. Then I started crying every single day at school. And I didn't really know why. I wasn't completely sure. Like, I knew I was sad because I'd lost some friends, but I had something in my mind saying, you're weak if you lost friends and you're crying about it. So I had a very twisted you know, viewpoint of it at the time. So I was crying every day. This was mainly a school issue. My home life was really nice. I didn't have any problems there. My distress was mainly at school. So clearly everyone else knew I was depressed, but I didn't learn about mental health again, so I didn't really know what depression was. I learned what anxiety was, but now I'm understanding that I'm feeling depressed. That's what people are saying. So okay, I'm depressed. All right, how do I deal with that? My teacher was the first person to notice these signs, though. And he really tried to help me. I still feel a little bad to this day that he wasn't able to help me because he really tried to. The reason why he wasn't able to help me was because I didn't know how to help him help me, if that makes sense. So I couldn't explain what was going on in my mind. I couldn't explain why I was so sad. I couldn't explain anything about my life. I was just so upset. So when he tried to help me and I wasn't able to get him to a place where he understood, he decided to give my mom a phone call. And based on that phone call where he said, you know, <coughs> Christine is just a different person. So she's crying every day. She's not happy. Something is very wrong. Based on that phone call, my mom came to me again, and we decided we'd try therapy again. So I went into counseling again, and about two months, or I should say two sessions, so two weeks, into my counseling with my new therapist, I kind of opened up about some different things that were going on. Everyone knew that I had anxiety. It was pretty apparent. Everyone knew that I was depressed and very visual. Everybody knew that. What they didn't know, and what my teacher couldn't tell my mom, because he didn't even know, was that I was experiencing early psychosis symptoms as well. So I didn't say anything about it because I really didn't know what psychosis was. I didn't have any idea what these symptoms were. It was a little bit, I wouldn't say terrifying, but it was very scary at first. It was not understanding why things were happening. So for example, I have a colorful stuffed animal that sits on my bed. And there was this one time when I walked past my room and I peeked into my room and sitting on the bed was a stuffed animal. But it was completely dark. It was not colorful anymore. And sometimes I would see shadows on the ground, but the sun wasn't out to create a shadow, so I was kind of confused about that. And I would think that the toughest one for me, because I was hard not to act upon it, was seeing some change in eye color. So for example, I went on a walk around the school uh, with one of my friends, Lorraine, and I looked into her eyes. She has beautiful brown eyes, but they looked completely black. It wasn't her normal eye color. So, there was a couple of those early signs, and then, after those little signs, it kind of gradually just got worse and worse, and I started experiencing full-on hallucinations. So, for me, I had auditory hallucinations, so I could hear, for me in particular, I won't go too in-depth, but I could hear demonic figures, and those same voices I could see sometimes. So, auditory and visual, um, they were the same hallucinations, just sometimes I'd hear them, sometimes I'd see them, sometimes both at the same time. I think the hardest part of the hallucinations was command hallucinations. I'm not sure if that's really the technical term for it, but for me, these voices would say, do this. I'm going to threaten you. You need to do this. So for example, they say, we're going to hurt someone that you love if you don't run away from home. So it's kind of like a command and something that I would act upon because I thought it was so real. So I had those early signs leading into full-on hallucinations. Because of my symptoms, I did end up in a mental hospital for a period of time. But out of everything that I experienced, I gotta say, it wasn't really the symptoms that was the hardest part. It was the stigma that kind of surrounded me. It made it much more difficult to cope. It made it much more difficult to feel okay with myself. So those were kind of the challenges with the psychosis. But when I went to that therapy center and I said, started explaining some of these symptoms, 
the therapist actually looked at me and she said, this is not the right place for you to be receiving therapy. And at first I was kind of like bummed. I'm like, geez, does anyone want to help me? Like, what's going on? She actually, blessing in disguise, she referred me to an early psychosis prevention center. And at this early psychosis prevention center, I finally got the help that I needed. So it's not an inpatient program, it's an outpatient program. So I did not live there, but I was there almost every single day. I received tons of therapy there. So I had individual therapy, occupational therapy, um, family therapy, multi-family group therapy. I also got school help. At the time I was 12 years old, so I needed an accommodation plan at school to help me with my symptoms. They helped me do that. There was some peer support um, services there, and they also started me on the prescribed medication journey. Um, very frustrating journey, but it's something that I'm really glad that I went on because it has been very helpful for me once we did find the right combo for me. Um, and I also started seeing my psychiatrist at the CARE program. Before I move on to high school challenges, I just want to explain that anyone who's going through a psychosis or any mental health challenge, please know that your journey is not just your journey. Our struggles affect everyone around us, and I think the good part about that is that we're not in the journey alone. So never feel guilty for being in this position and feeling like you're affecting everyone. It's more just coming together and getting through this journey together. None of us are alone. My parents struggled immensely when I was struggling. My brother struggled immensely when I was struggling. We did have family therapy. We also did family meetings. They were a little bit easier for us to talk openly with each other, so we had family meetings weekly at home. We also had to learn patience and self-care, not just for ourselves, but to make sure we're being considered to each other. So just some different things about how the impact, not just family, but friends and everyone around us. But to kind of close off the struggles part of my journey, there's high school. So by the time I got into high school, I'd been at the prevention center for quite a while. So I learned a lot of coping skills. I learned a lot about myself. So when I got into high school, I was mainly at the stage of managing my symptoms and maintaining my healthy mind. I was not really too much in the depths of everything. I kind of got past that with the coping. The problem was when I got into high school, I had no friends. And because of some of the stigma, it wasn't easy to make friends. Um, so I didn't really have anyone to hang out with at school. I did feel like a burden to school staff. And I understand that it's very overwhelming for staff to have to you know, be around and try to take care of their students, especially those who are struggling the way that I was but it's also very hard to feel like a burden to them. Um, and so it just it was an unfortunate situation, but I did decide that the best um, choice for me was to switch schools. So I went from a regular traditional high school and I went into an independent study charter high school. And basically at that school, I was going in about three days a week for three hours on those three days. And the rest of the work I did at home. And it was very much self-paced, so I was able to get ahead in school. And I had a very flexible schedule, which allowed me to create Brain XP, which is the last part of my journey because that is where I'm at now. When I was 16, uh, still at the charter school, but when I was 16, I was ready to share my story. I'd always wanted to share my story ever since I started struggling, but I didn't feel ready. I wasn't sure how to communicate it yet. But by the time I was 16, I felt like I was ready. So I started writing down my, my journey and my story, and it ended up becoming a manuscript and I actually sent it to um, a really, really kind woman who has mental health challenges in her family, who edited the book, and then by the time I was almost 17, still 16, but almost 17, uh, we self-published the book. So it's an autobiography. I know it's a little weird, <laughs> an autobiography from birth to 16, but there's a lot of stuff in there, so <laughs> it does make sense. Um, so I just want to mention that it's not like a whole lot, but it's a good read because it's not too long. And I found that a lot of teens and young people read the book because it's not, you know, 500 pages. <laughs> um, so it's an easy read. It reads like a novel because some of the experiences that I had with psychosis seem like fiction. <laughs> so it kind of reads like a novel. Um, and it's called Brain XP, Living with Mental Illness, A Young Teenager's Perspective. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later and put the title up there. But I self-published the book, and then a year later when I was 17, um, the autobiography became an international award-winning book, and at that point I was like, hmm, something's really working here. People were giving me tons of feedback about Brain XP, which is the title of the book, and I'll go into that later about what that means. They loved this concept of Brain XP. They liked that the story wasn't, it was sad at times, but it came out hopeful at the end. 
which was the biggest part that they liked, was that they could read the book, they could feel all the emotions that I was feeling, but at the end, they felt that hope that I really, really wanted them to have. So based on their feedback, they wanted me to start out more than just the book, but more like a community and a project for it. So I did that. I started up the Brain XP Project, so it's an organization about mental health for young people and the community, which we'll talk all about that later. And I also started speaking at conferences about my story and about Brain XP. So that's what I'm here today to do, and that's what I've been doing for the past couple of years. It's my full-time job, and that's where I'm at now. So I would like to go ahead and stop here. If there are any questions about my journey, I can answer a couple if, if there are any. If not, we can save them for the part four Q&A. But I just wanted to stop here just to give us a little break, because that was a lot. <laughs> Are there any cuts? Yes. So you mentioned going to um, like a charter school? A charter school? A charter school. Yes, a charter yeah. school. Um, and it was less hours, more self-paced. Do you think that, uh, that worked out a lot better for you um, than going to like a structured, regular traditional school? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Because the charter school does not, that model does not work for everybody. But because I had enough Discipline. I, I was a pretty, I learned discipline growing up, so I was very disciplined, so I was able to get the work done at home. I, I mean, my mom has been extremely helpful in, in my journey, and she helps me stay on top of these things to make sure that I was still on track. That is the part about the charter school that was hard, is that you don't have the same routine that you do in a traditional high school, um, but it ended up being better for me because I was able to um, work a little bit more on myself and my coping. It was hard to do that at a traditional high school. Um, but yes, it was a good choice for me. Um, it was a risky choice because I wasn't sure about it, but it ended up working out really well. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Hi, I have a, um, a question from Zoom. Okay. Um, one of the students, Roger, is asking, um, what are your thoughts on the stigma of being labeled as suffering from psychosis? I think that it's hard because even I kind of talk like that, suffering from this, suffering from that. I think the main thing about the stigma for me is I wasn't, I'm not typically offended by a lot of things, so when people start using terms like sick, crazy, or psycho, things like that, those are the terms that get me, because I think that's a little bit more than just saying, oh, the weather's bipolar today, because people use these terms not necessarily accurately or considerately. Um, I think the one thing about psychosis is that I'm fine myself saying I've suffered from psychosis. What I don't really appreciate is when we kind of turned it into that kid's crazy, that kid's psycho, that kid's mentally ill. It's That's why I started Brain XP, and I'll explain what Brain XP stands for and it'll make a lot more sense. But the stigma that I faced wasn't necessarily all labeling. It was the actions toward me um, and the talk behind the gossip, behind everybody. Um, but I do think that it is important that everyone kind of is careful with how we speak to each other because something that might not have offended me could be insulting or, or hurtful to somebody else. Um, but as far as suffering from, I would say I, I, I use that about myself as well. So I just think some of the labels that are more attacking it are harder for me. I hope that answered that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions about this part? Um, and if you have any that pop up later, part four is the Q&A as well. Okay. <coughs> So we'll move on to part two, which is Brain XP's System of Hope. So this is a unique system, as I said before. It's a system that my mom and I sat down and created based on how I got through my struggles and became my own advocate. So it is a four-step system, helping young people get from wherever they're at, whatever struggles they're facing, helps them learn to cope and become their own advocates. This system helped me immensely along my mental health journey, but most specifically, with the psychosis symptoms. So it is a four step system, healthy mind, open sharing, positive coping, and empowerment. I am going to go into each of these steps now so we can clearly understand how this system works. So we start off with healthy mind, which is H in the system of hope. This is what I call building the foundation, building your healthy mind. You're gonna see the components, these are not all of them, but components of building a healthy mind on the screen. So Healthy eating, exercising, getting enough sleep, socializing, being productive, sticking to a schedule, following a routine. These are all great components of a healthy mind. Obviously there's more, but this is what I put on the screen. But it's kind of hard to know how to like, let those components into your life. So this is how I built my foundation. 
I did five minute daily tracking in a journal. Specifically, I wrote down all the Healthy Mind components, these ones you see here, wrote them all down in the journal, and I just said, did I do this today? Did I not do this today? And then I also wrote down any triggers that I experienced that day, and if I used any coping strategies, if they worked or if they didn't work, um, or if they helped at all, even a little bit. I also kept a timeline in this journal of events and episodes. For example, if I had a event where I ran away from home because I had a hallucination experience. I would put that in the timeline and I would make sure I put the date there. If I had a psychotic episode or maybe a depression episode, I'd put that in there as well with the date. The reason why this worked so well for me was because I could go back and see the tracking and see if there were setbacks or progress being made. This was a huge part of how I learned more about myself <coughs> and um, seeing what was helping and what wasn't helping. I know you're thinking, you know, like, it's five minutes a day, but I don't really want to spend five minutes a day to do this. I, I get it. I didn't necessarily want to either all the time. So if you're not able to track daily, I would suggest trying every few days or weekly even, just because I know how beneficial this was for me. Okay, the second step in the system of hope is open sharing. This is the hardest step for me, or at least it was, you know, for me. This is where we share the foundation that we've built with a healthy mind. It is very difficult, at least it was for me, to talk about my struggles and try not to internalize them. I tried not to get to a blow up point where everything was bottled up and bottled up and then I explode because that's never good, but it's very difficult not to do that. But it's also very difficult to battle alone, which is why we have to openly share. So talking about it, trying not to internalize too much, um, and being accepting of help. There's um, someone that I know, his name is John, he always says, you know, you made it through this because you're a willing player. And I like that term because being accepting of help is being a willing player. It's like, I'm willing to play in this game. I'm going to make it through. So it's this sort of little thing that I love that he says to me. And remember that asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. So it's very important to keep that in your mind because I know a lot of people who don't want to ask for help because they think that they're weak. They do. It's not that way at all. At all. No. And you can join the Brain XP community, which I'll talk about later, where you can relate to others while also learning to cope, and that can be a great place to share with others as well. There are a couple of other ways that I did this sharing the foundation, open sharing. Like I said, I was not an open person. I did not want to talk about all this stuff, so I started very, very small. I reached out to one person who I trusted, and I did not like verbal dump on them. I was not like, this is what's going on. I have this hallucination. This guy told me to do this today, and I got really anxious about it. I didn't do that. I literally just, little by little, you know, I was feeling anxious yesterday. That's it. That's all I have to say. And little by little, I started to open up more and more. So it's not necessarily you have to dump everything all at once, because that, I understand, is very difficult. It was for me. So starting small is great, too. I also want to mention that keeping an open mind when accepting help is really important as well because there are different treatment options out there that sometimes we might hesitate to take or we might not want to try that treatment option, but it could be the thing that really helps us. For example, uh, I didn't want to go the prescribed medication route. I was actually, unfortunately, the reason why was because I couldn't swallow a pill when I was 11 years old. I didn't want to take pills, um, but I was open to it, and when I finally got prescribed meds and I had to force myself, okay, you have to learn how to do this. And because I was open to it, that method of treatment really ended up helping me. So it's just keeping an open mind about the different treatment options. And the last thing that I did for open sharing, I was 13 years old when I was in like the depths of everything. Like everything was just, that was the worst part for me with my mental health. So at 13 years old, I had everybody ask me questions, my family, my friends, you know, what are you experiencing? Were you in the hospital? Did, did you feel this way? Or do you have hallucinations? I mean, tons of questions. So I took all of the questions that I could remember and I wrote them down and I made a video answering all of the questions. And I was obviously had enough confidence, at least at that time, to upload the video to YouTube. And when I uploaded the video, I sent the link to anyone who asked me a question. And believe it or not, they all, everyone who saw it, started sending it to their friends and their family and the amount of support that I received based on that one video was incredible because they understood now. They had a little glimpse of what I'm actually going through and they felt that they could support me better and they felt like they could understand me better. So I know that's not really um, an option for everybody. It's a little scary to do that, put it all out there online. But you can also create a private video or 
or another form of creativity just to share with people what you're actually going through without having to communicate with them directly because um, that was hard for me if you do want to check out that video it's called my depression story on our brain xp youtube channel um, which you'll see later so on the youtube channel the third step in the system of hope is positive coping p um, and this is where we maintain the foundation that we've built and that we're sharing so I like to go over three types of coping skills. One is interactive skills. I really like this one because it allows me to be with others and help others. There's also personal skills, the things that I could do on my own, like creativity and mindfulness. There's also positive everyday practices, like gratitude and saying positive affirmations. Now, the thing for me is that I try to find one coping skill. And that's okay to start with, at least for me, but I found that having one coping skill wasn't enough for me, because having one coping skill for me, it was playing my guitar. If I'm at school, I can't play my guitar. If I'm on the go, if I'm driving somewhere, I can't play my guitar. So what I did is I wrote down one to two interests or hobbies that I could use as coping skills for my home life, did the same thing for my school life, and did the same thing for my on-the-go life. And that really helped me know like what's working, and it really was trial and error for me. Some coping skills I picked out when I tried, and it did not work. So I just tossed them and I tried a new one. It was trial and error and I finally found one to two for each of these areas. So setting short-term goals and rewards is so beneficial for me. I set daily, weekly, and monthly goals for accomplishments related to coping and I gave myself small rewards to keep me motivated to keep coping. So if you're struggling to find coping skills, I'll put this um, it's in the later slide, but our website is brainxp.org, and you'll see that again. But we have a teen toolbox, and it is teen toolbox, but it works for a lot of young people and adults as well. And you can visit our teen toolbox tab on our website, and you'll click on coping skills kit, and you'll find a place that has a master list of a ton of coping skills. But you can print out, you can save on your phone, or put on your fridge, whatever you need to do to remind yourself, okay, coping, I can try this, I can try that. The other thing that I get asked a lot is, I don't know when to reward myself. That's a great question, because I didn't know either. So what I suggest is referring back to the healthy mind tracking, or the goals that we've set for ourselves. And so if we see any progress, or any great effort in any one of those areas of coping, I would reward myself. It didn't have to be a full success, but if I gave a lot of effort, I would reward myself. And the final step in the system of hope is E, empowerment. This is where we become our own advocates. So I started by advocating for myself, finding a passion and let it motivate and inspire me to keep going. For me, it was mental health advocacy. And then I started to set goals to push my comfort zones just a little bit. Then I started advocating for others, because yes, it is great to advocate for yourself, but there's somebody else who could benefit from your advocacy. So that's when I started advocating for others, encouraging positivity, leading by example, and being an inspiration for them are some of the things that we can do for that. A couple of ways to be your own advocate, because it's a lot easier said than done. I would say be present with your advocacy in stressful environments and situations. Know when you need to take breaks. Know when you need to say no. I mean, there are tons of situations that pop up that aren't good for us to say no, which is a lot easier said than done, I understand. And also, finding support in the good and bad times. A lot of times we find support from ourselves or others when we're going through transitions or changes, losses or experiencing grief, which is normal. We try to find support, but we should also find support when we're happy and having happy accomplishments because just because we're doing well doesn't mean we have to stop all of our supports because when I stopped all of my supports, I backtracked. So it's just maintaining keeping up with it. Okay, are there any questions that I can answer right now about the system of hope? Because that is the full system. Um, or I can take those questions at the, at the end as well. But yes? Um, what was O? O? Mm -hmm. Open sharing. Open sharing. If there are none, I can move on to part three. Okay, cool. So part three, all about Brain XP. So first things first, Brain XP stands for Brain Expanded. When I was 13 years old, and this goes back to the stigma question, when I was 13 years old, I was being labeled as mentally ill, crazy, sick, psycho. 
And there was one, at a point in time when I just was fed up with it. I, I, couldn't, I could not handle it anymore. So I was actually walking uh, my dog, you know, Asher, but <laughs> Sparky, my former dog. I was walking with Sparky with um, my mom, 20 minute dog walk, and I just let everything loose. I'm like, mom, I cannot stand this. They call me mentally ill. They're calling me sick and crazy and psycho. They can't even say it to my face. I was really upset. So I, um, I told her about that, and she looked at me and she said, well, then why don't we just call it something different? I'm like, that's a really good idea. So we bounced some ideas back and forth, and we wanted a positive term to represent mental illness. So my mom came up with Brain XP. She said it stands for Brain Expanded. She just thought this completely on her own. It's Brain Expanded. Think about it. You and all the other young people that we know who are struggling with their mental health think in incredible, creative, insightful, empathetic, amazing ways. It's like your brains are expanded. You just think in different ways. And I thought, that's it. That's, that's the term. That's what we need. Because it's very positive. It's very empowering. And it makes us feel special because we are. So our mission with Brain XP is changing the language of mental health by focusing on positivity. We're advocating for understanding of mental health to be greater than the fear of it. So our organization has a website, as I mentioned before, brainxp.org. We offer a lot of free resources and just different offerings. So I mentioned briefly the Teen Toolbox. So we have a Teen Toolbox and master list of coping skills. But when you go into the Teen Toolbox, you'll also see a five-part coping skill series with videos, blog posts, podcast episodes, guides that you can download. And it's all free, and it's just helping you learn how to use the coping skills that are on the master list. We also offer educational mental health YouTube videos music videos, blog posts, and podcast episodes. We have featured resources as well from other places we've collaborated with or worked with, we call them our Brain XP Buddies. Um, and then we also have live presentations, workshops, and events, including Brain XP Day. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it, but our former mayor proclaimed April 28th every year is Brain XP Day in the city of San Diego. So we always do something very, very special for that. We also have the book, which I mentioned earlier, Brain XP, Living with Mental Illness, A Young Teenager's Perspective by Christine Marie Fry. I want to go into this just for a second. It is 10 chapters worth of my mental health journey and my perspective as a 16-year-old. But this book is not just for the person who's struggling. In the back of the book, my mom wrote a chapter from her perspective. My best friend, Rachel, wrote a few pages from her perspective. And my grandparents did the same. So everybody has a little piece in this book. Everyone can learn from it. We also have merch items. Um, typically we do this in person, so I probably shouldn't have put that there on the website, but in-person purchases at our events. If you're ever wanting to get some of our merch, come to one of our events. And we're coming down to the wire here. We have some services. They're all lived experience-based services. So we have custom keynote speaking engagements. Um, we start with Brain XP System of Hope, or a story of hope, which is just my journey and then we amend them to fit every single audience, so it's definitely a custom engagement. We have our online teen course and online parent course about the system of hope coming very, very soon, so please stay tuned for that because it's like learning what you learned here about the system of hope, but way more in depth and step-by-step -step with worksheets and um, all the videos that go with it. So it's a really in-depth course. So I would just hang tight for that because it's gonna be great. And the last service that we offer is brand new, I mean, really brand new, is our creator programs. So we have two creator programs at the moment, and the first one is a one-on-one -on -one TikTok influencer mentorship program. This is for aspiring mental health advocates that want to build a platform and build their own community to share and spread mental health awareness. So that's one of the programs. We also have the social media influencer program. This is for established mental health creators, typically 10,000 followers or over, who want to take their advocacy to the next level with more opportunities. So we have these two um, programs, and if you want to learn more about them, I think it's on there, yes. Visit brainxp.org slash creator dash programs to apply. We do have limited availability right now, so I would pop on it quickly if you're wanting to do anything with that. But I do want to say that these are not therapy sessions and not mental health treatment services. They're advocacy services. And finally, our community is the best part about Brain XP by far. So here's how you can join. You can follow and engage on social media. TikTok and Instagram are our main platforms. You can follow us at Brain XP Project and engage with all the youth we have there. 
And then we also have our newsletter subscription, completely free. You can sign up on brainxp.org. You just scroll to the bottom, you'll see a newsletter sign up. And then you'll start receiving Brain XP updates right to your inbox. So when our courses come out, when we have Brain XP Day, any updates or announcements. It's going blank on me. Well, that was the last slide anyway. Um, so now I'm happy to answer any questions, but I wanted to leave you with these words. Welcome to the Brain XP community. I hope you feel at home. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking for you all. I'm happy to answer any questions now if there are any last ones that we have. Or from Zoom as well.